Hi there friends, Dave Plays. Can I Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And Huck is in and out of the room, acting like a crazy woman. And the reason being is uh, this morning I woke up, I was taking her out to the used restroom. And we stepped outside and she, her paws touched the wet ground. And she all of a sudden woke up. She thought, oh my gosh, it rained. It's winter, it's cold. And this is the first morning, it was kind of down in the 30s. And anyone knows Great Pyrenees, they love cold weather. And she just went crazy, loving it. And uh, been a little feisty today, so it was fun. Now this is Missing 411, this is about missing people. And we're gonna talk about missing people, some letters, some theories. We got some really good letters today. And we got a couple of cases that are gonna blow your socks off. One of the cases from Yosemite National Park, the biggest cluster in the world, and one of the strangest cases to ever come out of Yosemite we're gonna talk about. So, so the big, big, big news, and I, I'm gonna keep hammering this because when you see it, you're gonna understand it. Our third documentary is completed. It's gonna premiere November 12th in Tempe, Arizona at a museum there. And they've got a beautiful auditorium that I've spoke at many, many times. And the tickets are for sale on our website. And uh, hopefully you'll attend. It's going to be a full night starting at 5 o'clock. Uh, we've got a catered dinner for people. Uh, we've got drinks. We're going to have a Q&A. We're going to have some interviews with some noted people in, in your world. You'll know them because they're going to be there. Uh, It'll be a lot of fun. The, uh, it's a big auditorium, so we've got a lot of people to fill up, but the tickets have been selling really well. We're very lucky. And uh, people have asked, how are we gonna distribute the film? Well, we're still trying to determine exactly how. And we're in negotiations on many fronts, so we'll see how that turns out. But uh, as long as I get my money back, I mean, it's been three years, so I've I poured a lot of money into this thing over a three-year span, and I just hope I, I can recover enough to make it through this time. And uh, let's go on to the letters. Hey, Dave. My name is Sean. I'm 50 years old. I'm from Ashland County, Ohio, Ludenville area, now living in Midlothian, Texas. I was raised by my grandparents in rural Ashland County Farm, mostly a beef cattle farm. These stories were never talked about outside the immediate area. But in August of 1967, my grandmother had bought a used 65 Ford Galaxy. My parents, three foster children, and my mom were pulling into the driveway at the farm and stopped in front of the house. While seated there, to the east of them, about 100 yards on top of a hill, a row of red and white lights appeared. My grandmother asked my grandfather to turn off the car. He did. There was no sound from the row of lights. They thought it might be helicopter or helicopters, but then it rose up above the tree line, sat there a few seconds, and that's when they realized it was a saucer-shaped craft. It shot north above the trees and was gone. My mother said the next morning that they walked on top of the hill and found no marks in the wheat field. Skip forward to the summer of 1980. I go to bed that night, wake up that morning, recounting floating into the sky back into my bedroom window. Floating back in, so it must have meant he was out there at some point. I have this feeling like they agreed to let me fly around the yard before they put me back to bed. I could see everything, like it was daylight, but it was red and solid objects were black. I saw my bike in the yard, the top of the crab apple tree. It was awesome. I was looking down at the whole entire farm as I was slowly moving back towards my window as if in a beam of light. Second memory. My grandparents moved me to a room in the basement probably in 82. I woke up probably at about 4 a.m. to bright lights outside the two basement well windows in my room. The family dog her name was Lady, was going crazy outside. I could see shadows like 
it was running around the house as if guarding the property. I was frozen in fear, crying, paralyzed. It felt like it was hours, then it stopped. I wake up the next morning, go upstairs, ask everyone in the house, what was outside last night? The dog was going crazy. Everyone in the house said they heard nothing. How can that be? I think back on strange things, like before I ever heard the story of a UFO family encounter, my sister and I had a fort on top of that hill where they saw the UFO. And we would leave our toys there like we were leaving gifts. Jump forward to 2020, I started having paranormal experiences, lights flashing in the house, phones flying off fireplace mantles across the room, hearing strange things, seeing shadows, etc. In 2021, we go on vacation back to Ohio. We rent a cabin in Hocking Hills, southeast Ohio. It sits on 200 acres of wooded farmland. I wake up around 5 a.m. to a child's voice saying, Mom, 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 Mom. I finally say to my wife, Are you going to answer her? She doesn't. My, she doesn't wake up. I look up to not a child, but a blue-orange orb at the end of the bed. The crazy part is I just go back to sleep. I tell everyone the story, they think I'm crazy. About an hour later, my mother-in-law says to me, quote, I heard that little girl saying, Mom, end of quotes. She said, when she looked in my room, door was open, there was no orb and no girl. That night, sitting outside at dusk with my wife, I tell her I feel like we are being watched. Then right in front of us, up the hill in the woods, we hear a very large limb breaking. Because it was being twisted, then we hear it to our far right. Then we hear it across the cornfield. I tell my wife it's Bigfoot. They're letting us know they're here. There's a lot more to these stories, but this is what I could type on the phone. Thank you for your work, your words, and your knowledge. Sincerely. Well, thank you. It was a couple super interesting stories. Now, what surprises a lot of people is that over the years, Ohio has had a lot of strange things happen there. In our movie, Missing 411 The Hunted, and you can watch it. The link is right under here. It's for free. We've got new links up. Missing 411 in the second documentary, Missing 411 The Hunted. We did a story out of Ohio, right next to some farmland. So, yeah, I knew a lot of strange things go on in Ohio. So, for what it's worth. Hey Dave, many of your viewers write in describing about their experiences with seemingly invisible people stalking them along trails. About a year ago, I was sitting in my backyard at night smoking a cigarette and I heard a person walking through the alley behind my garage. I didn't think it was strange. It's unfortunately common as this isn't a great neighborhood. I heard each footfall on the dirt and gravel in the alley. Then the person entered my neighbor's backyard and I heard each footfall in the foliage of my neighbor's giant garden of a backyard. I was concerned that it may be a burglar. I was sitting in the dark shadow, so I decided to wait to see the person before going into my garage. To my surprise, the footfalls tracked directly to the chain link fence closest to me. I thought it was dark, there was enough light to see that there was no person or animal where the footfalls ended. I kept my distance but went further down the fence line to get an even better look and there was clearly no one there. I went back in the house and didn't go outside again that night. I live in Pueblo, Colorado, about three blocks from Interstate 25 next to the steel mill. About five years ago, sitting in the same spot at the same time, I suddenly saw orbs of flying light circling the tree in my neighbor's front yard. At least there would be visible at once. Each appeared at the top of the tree, then moved downward diagonally. The whole spectacle similar to a barber's pole. I looked above the tree, expecting to see some sort of UFO, but there was nothing strange above the tree. The whole event lasted 30 seconds. In 2010, overlooking the Arkansas River from Pueblo City Park, a friend and I saw an orange orb. It split into two, and the second orb also split into two for a total of three orange orbs sitting in a row. My friend and I had gone there hoping to see a UFO, and it seemed as though our wish was granted, but not in a figurative sense. It seemed, as though the, it seemed as though the orbs knew we were there hoping to see something and put on a little show for us, like they're telepathic. Good observation. First of all, I think 
there's something to the telepathy side. Dr. Stephen Greer has made a career out of that, uh, meditating and such and being able to call in UFOs. I have a friend of mine, very close friend, that goes out and regularly films UFOs, and I know he does, and he has he tells me that he meditates and to get them to come in. So I understand that. Now this area of Pueblo, Colorado, that's really interesting because I've had, back when I lived in Colorado, I had a series of reports come in along the Arkansas River, along the Arkansas River of Bigfoot sightings and people finding large tracks in that area. Kind of weird, but it's a strange area. All that, that entire area all the way to Colorado Springs has had a lot of strange stuff going on. Next letter. Hey, Dave. I'm impressed with your dedication to the village. Mental illness and trying to figure out why people are going missing under strange circumstances. I'm proud to be a part of the village. This is my first email, and I'll try to make it brief. Berry pickers. Could there be a rare strain of huckleberries that contain a natural chemical that makes a person substantially paranoid and fearful, thus running away and hiding from everyone looking for them and becoming so fearful they end up dying from fear and so fearful they would rather cover themselves up in a hole and die of suffocation than be caught? The ones that are found and don't remember what happened could possibly have antibodies or genes that counteract the chemicals it affects. If you're alleging that this could happen and cause the people to disappear who were eating the huckleberries. A lot of people that pick huckleberries don't eat them. They just pick them. A lot of people that pick the huckleberries are actually people that are paid to do it. But then this doesn't answer well, why doesn't canines track the person and find them wherever they're hiding because they should be able to. Or why can't professional trackers find the tracks and track the people to where they eventually will be found doesn't answer that question. And the answer to that is no, there's, I don't believe that at all. Hey Dave, do you know of any such potential chemical? No, never heard of such a thing. Cattle and ox mutilations. Since they remove particular organs, eyes, brain, uh, I don't think they do take the brain, eyes, liver, and genitals along with the blood, maybe they are capable of keeping alive the essence of the animal and thus do inhumane experimentations and transplantations. Could be. Could it be that a multi-billion dollar worldwide company has figured out how to keep people alive forever? Some very wealthy people would give most of their money for something like that. By putting the animals back in the same location, the companies are giving potential buyers the reassurance that their future longevities are being secured. Thus, the client releases funds for the next step in the longevity process. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. Or could it be another worldly race from a different planet or a different plane or people from our future coming back and trying to figure out how to regain the love, passion of love, regain the lost passion of love. They have either somehow lost that or the race is dying due to physiological changes, example, radiation poisoning, and they need those organs to continue their race. If you need a co-author for a science book, please let me know. There's at least a half dozen or so in this email alone. All kidding aside. There are trillions of observable stars in our universe. A person would have to be a little narcissistic to believe God has the only, that God has only created us. Just some thoughts and observations. Great email. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, It would have to be to not think that there could be others out there. I don't understand that logic. Sorry. Okay, new email. Hey, Dave, in regard to cattle mutilations and missing people, today your stories involve the possible involvement of either our government or ET aliens. Although I didn't see or hear this directly, I did happen to work with a director who had worked with for a super high-tech software defense company located in Southern California. To protect his true identity, I will use a pseudonym, Ed. Ed was a super smart director and software engineer 
with much credibility and some fascinating stories. In February 2014, I did witness three UFOs here in North Canton, Ohio. I was sleeping in bed at night around 3.30 a.m. when I woke up to go to the bathroom. As I stood up in our two-story house, I glanced out our front windows and saw three elliptically shaped UFOs just hover about a mile from the house, about 100 feet in the air. I turned to go to the bathroom, but then did a double take and got closer and observed them for about 10 to 15 minutes. I would say each was the size of a semi-truck with a trailer. They were totally quiet, just hovering. They were all very fuzzy on the surfaces and light emitting orange red from, a, from within. I thought about driving over to Apple Grove and North Main Street near water and also observed Hanover coal mines to take a closer look but decided against it. Why? First, it was a very cold February night. Too cold. Two, I thought it was a very bad idea to assume that they were friendly. Three, although very curious, I started to think that it may be a lot smarter to hide under my bed or in the closet or at least stay home. Well, I gotta say that <coughs> not assuming they are all friendly is a great idea. Because you don't know. I thought about going downstairs to get a camera, but I was afraid that they'd be gone by the time I returned. After a 10-15 minute period, they abruptly and quickly accelerated straight south at a high speed in the same formation. Why didn't I report them? I'm a degreed professional engineer and I did not want companies to think I was crazy, so I just kept it quiet. I did not want my name showing up on a police report or employability reasons. At that time, I had no other ideas about where to report them anyways. So first of all, whether you report to the Northern UFO Reporting Center, New Fork, or you report it to MUFON, you could do it online, you could do it anonymously. They really are UFOs, 100%. I've seen them myself. They do not look man-made at all. Could it be that these are alien greys out looking for water, possibly humans, and animals to experiment? It's totally aligns with what my buddy Ed told me back in 2013. And he was smart. That was before I personally observed the UFOs. What else could UFOs be? It turns out that the U.S. government has several members, mostly Republicans, who do not want to pursue investigating UFOs because they strongly believe that they are demons. What evidence is there pointing to demons? One, UFOs look almost translucent, almost like pure energy with light but without mass. Two, UFOs seem to know where our fighter pilots... Number two, UFOs seem to know where our fighter pilots, like David Fravor, are going without telecommunications. That is correct. Three, UFOs have been known to hover nuclear missile sites and turn them off so they can't be used. What are UFOs? A lot of evidence points to aliens and super advanced technology, including all the things my buddy had told me. But UFOs also appear to be fully capable of doing things that not even super sophisticated advanced aliens ought to be capable of doing, reading minds. USOs being capable of very fast speeds below water, instantan instantaneous acceleration, disabling nuclear weapons remotely, appearing and disappearing into thin air and water. Personally, I do not know for sure. They could be demons or fallen angels pretending to be aliens or they could be aliens pretending to be supernatural. Given their proven and unbelievable supernatural powers, I lean a little, I lean a little towards demons, demons. But I'm also open to what others think. I think UFOs can manifest into materials with mass or stay in a high energy light emitting field state. UFOs are sentient and respond to stimuli. UFOs can appear out of thin air, maybe through a portal, abduct a cow, perform the mutilation almost instantaneously, and return them right back. Doesn't this seem like a doesn't this seem like a stretch even for a super advanced alien species? Nope, not to me. And the reason may is that too many people have told me over the years that our advanced space systems 
are 50 years into the future being used right now. Meaning where the public thinks we are technology wise with aircraft, we're really 50 years more advanced. And we're using it quietly without the public knowing. Now, if you would believe that there have been civilizations that are hundreds of thousands of years old, older than us, well, you can imagine how far advanced they must be because they've also met other civilizations that were equally, equally advanced. Think about, I mean, really think about this. In the, in 1850, our mode of transportation was a horse. And 160, 170 years later, we're flying around the world, go to other planets, put in telescopes up in other galaxies. I mean, it's, it's amazing how far we've gotten in that period of time. And if you say, well, 10,000 years from now, how advanced will we be? We may not even be able to understand that. Next letter. Hey Dave, I just finished watching your Skinwalker video about missing livestock. I thought you may find this interesting. I grew up hunting in central North Carolina. I've had a few things happen over the years that I don't understand. About 18 years ago, I had a hunting lease near P-D-P-E-E-D-E-E -E 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 River. That's about 600 acres. I was in, it was in January and the deer season was over for us, so I was interested in setting up a game camera hoping to get some pictures of coyotes. I worked for a street department in our town and one morning I got a call from one of the police officers about a dead deer that was hit by a car that needed to be moved. I took the deer to the hunting lease for bait whatever for whatever I could catch on the game camera. I picked a thicket that was covered with briars and thick brush to prevent my camera from being stolen. I placed a hundred pound doe in front of the camera, tied a rope tightly around its neck to a tree to prevent anything from dragging her away from the camera. I returned about four days later, eager to see how many coyotes that I may have caught on film. When I returned, the deer was gone. So was the rope. <laughs> I tied to the tree. I still remember pulling on that rope, thinking nothing could break it. There wasn't any hair or signs of leaves being disturbed, so I started making circles around. Something must have somehow dragged it off, but I found nothing. I, th I checked the camera card and it had pictures of me sitting, sitting and setting up the bait the first day. The next day the deer had a few small birds land on it and the camera took a few pictures. The pictures taken over the next days after clearly showed the deer was gone. The camera continued to take a picture over the next few days of birds and blowing tree limbs. It even took pictures of me returning. So there's no way anyone could have cut that rope without being caught on camera told the story to a few friends that of course said that the unusual, like somebody is pranking you, but then that camera costs 300 bucks and I can't imagine someone taking the deer without taking the camera. Never found any trace of hair, bone, blood, or anything, or my rope. I still wonder what happened. Well, Dave, I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. Thanks for all you were doing and keeping up the work. I've got another good one to write to you about later on that happened back in my 20s. I've hesitated to tell it because it sounds too made up. It happened to me hunting in an abandoned granite quarry that I grew up beside. And besides, the granite quarry was my aunt's field that we picked blackberries every summer. I've told you my wife about these things and I love giving her that look every time you bring up those two things. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you. So, I've told the story before. Les Stroud, Survivor Man. Les and I have talked about a lot of things over the years, but there were a few times where we did projects together, so we had a lot of time together. He told me the story that uh, he was in British Columbia on the side of a hill, and uh, he was there about Bigfoot. He was doing a Bigfoot special. And Les said that uh, he had put this apple on a tree almost right in front of him, and he had a game camera on it. And I think he said it, it flashed at like a quarter of a second. And he said he woke up and 
camera was gone. He said there was nothing around, no tracks, no nothing. He said, well, that's weird. He goes, I got to look at uh, the chip in the camera. So he takes it out and looks, <laughs> nothing, nothing. And he goes, I don't quite know how anything could take that apple and the apple would move that wouldn't trigger the camera and get some sort of blurry picture at the least. So does it surprise me? No, I, th I think that's all part of the enigma that something weird goes on in our world. And if you believe in that theory that something can freeze time and space, if I freeze everything, reach my hand out, grab the apple and pull it back, never show up. Next letter, I suppose it's not a unique that I should reflect on the tales I've heard and read through the years. In your letters, you read a variety of theories or recount how you were dazzled at various conferences by people with detailed narratives of their own subject and how your own research is somehow, I don't know. Well, well I'll tell you what's tough, folks. I read these all before I come on and I make notes, corrections, and a lot of times I don't have time to do that. So I just have to push that story aside and not even read it. Please read your own note. Use punctuation, grammar, and paragraphs. Paragraphs, please, as it makes it a lot easier to read. What will make this unique is not only that it is devoid of reptilians and the ubiquitous, ubiquitous portals, but that what I'm proposing is the most terrifying idea I've ever heard linked to your topic. I read this and I thought, oh my gosh. In everything you've said, it seems to me that there is only one consistent and solid axiom that we were able to grab a hold of in this mer mercurial soup. The X factor did, that is the causative agent behind missing 411 does not make mistakes. From this, we are able to test a collection of possibilities to exclude them from the unknown category of the X factor behind missing 411. Here's the analysis. Nature. Are forces of nature in some manner known to never make mistakes? There are blind forces without agency, so the question probably does not apply. But being random, they could not produce effects that are similar to the inerrancy of X factor, and this cannot be natural. Human. Is there any human serial killer or group of serial killers who are known to have never made a mistake? No. Is there anything human that does not make mistakes? The federal government is certainly ruled out. <laughs> yeah, good one. Even in the lore of the yogis of India who are reported to possess the abilities to affect human perception, is the same body of lore we find where they can be defeated and so they do make mistakes. So the X factor cannot be human. Bigfoot classic cryptids. In the accounts and lore of Bigfoot, do we find that Bigfoot in abduction or interactions with humans is without mistake? No, so the X factor cannot be Bigfoot or cryptids. UFOs. The UFO lore of alien abduction, there are a variety of accounts of humans who are dressed in the wrong clothes or returned to the wrong place. You might recall Bud Hopkins had an account of a Manhattan abduction that was witnessed and that there was probably an error. The UFOs made mistakes and thus the X factor cannot be aliens from outer space, another dimension. God. In a Brahmanic theology, only God is without error. But the nature of these abductions do not seem to be consistent of that lore or the vision of God held by the faithful. Thus, we can assume God is not the X factor. In fact, humans have no direct knowledge of any of the class of beings or phenomena that does not make mistakes. The X factor behind the missing from one, one phenomena has being. It must be in order to act. But the nature of the being is not only that man cannot comprehend intellectually, but which we are capable of even fabricating in our own imaginations that are unbound to reality. There is no point of direct experiential contact with this phenomena. That is why it cannot be perceived. We have no mental equipment to construct whatever it might be that our senses would convey. That is assuming they are capturing raw data. The philosopher Immanuel Kant figured out 200 years ago that the human mind is limited by a defined set of inherent categories. These compromise the mental shell we all carry in an essential aspect of our human nature. This cannot be changed so long as we are human. 
What is beyond that shell is seen by us as an insolvable paradox. Logically, the X factor whose activity you have uncovered is of that nature. I leave you to contemplate the horrific implications. I leave you to think about those complications. It's a good, good note. I appreciate that. Well thought out, well written. Hey Dave, after many, many months of wanting to email you, I finally did it. I really struggled to type stuff up. My English is absolutely terrible, as you'll see. Anyway, my name is Blank. I'm 34 from a town near the greater Manchester in the UK. I will compose another email with much greater detail and more information. Okay, let's begin. I'd like to point out that some things about the missing people and what I actually 100% believe and know what's going on to doing it. No pride here or ego, but if you start to follow what I write, and most importantly is to be a believer in God, you will know for sure that this is the truth. So let me stop everybody for a second. A lot of people get turned off right away when people start talking about God. Take a breath. What I learned many years ago from someone very smart, much smarter than me, said, Dave, whatever your biases is about religion and God, I want you to think about something. You like to study history, right? Yeah, I do. Well, the Bible is one of the best historical pieces of literature that we have. And if nothing else, pay attention to what's said in it. You could learn a lot. And you know, for me, that turned my paradigm. And I started paying attention a lot more when I was younger. So here we go. The truth is with God, and God has sent prophets, and they teach us nothing but the truths and facts, if only we'll be listening. Now, I know you heard this as a theory before about the jinn, G-I-N, and being a cause, but please let me explain some things to make it sound easier and I hope more understandable. God created all things in pairs. When God created the sun, he created the moon. He created fresh water, he created salty water, he created man, he created woman. The positive, the negative, the yin, the yang. Even down to our blood, it is paired. The red, the white, even our chromosomes. Every single thing is created in pairs. Even some things we may not yet understand. Think about this sometime, Dave, and ponder it in your spare time. Think about things that are around us. Even small as an atom. All things are indeed created in pairs. It's unbelievable. Every world that God created, he created a parallel world running side by side or over the top of each other. We, of course, inhabit this world, but the parallel world running side by side ours is the world of the jinn, J-I-N-N. God, true one God, Allah, the God of Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them, said he created man and jinn for no other reason but to worship him. We are created from mixed clay, and if you look up the colors of the clay in the ground, they match every skin color. Adam, the first of us, was created with a mix of them all. It was only Eve that had an insane amount of wombs. No one else after Eve, even multiple wombs. It was just Eve. In fact, I think over 360 she had. Every time she got pregnant, each womb would produce twins, boy and a girl. One would be looking and the other not so good looking. And it was only okay then for the decedents to mate with one another from a different womb. And this is where we came from. People may say, how can somebody possibly have so many wombs? Well, they were actual giants compared to us. The first generation had very tall, elongated bodies, possibly 60 feet tall or more, and they lived very long lives. Adam, a thousand years. 50,000 years ago, Adam was created. I think this is a true timeline of humans, and they was truly giants compared to us. Just go research mud fossils, and you see real giants turn to stone. Forget MUD USA, the Quran states, walk in the land freely and look what happened to the disbelievers. They were bigger than anyone in the process today. And if Allah wants to, so he can turn you into hardened stone. And if Allah wishes, he can still make your eyes and ears work. Allah can do all things. So after the first generation created each bone and after they got smaller and lived for less, 
Just go to Google, quote, the graves of the prophets. You'll see how tall they were. Please go to Google and you'll see for yourself. The jinn, they are made of smokeless fire or the tip of the flame of the blue where it's really hot. People today who have paranormal experiences with them name them ghost spirits or poltergeist, but they're the same being. And these are 100% responsible for the missing 411 cases. So let's go over some things, some spokes in the wheel. Oh, somebody's paying attention. You guys know what a spoke in the wheel is? You're gonna learn. Granite, granite does not contain any metals. It's the only rock on earth that contains zero metals. It's an ancient rock. When God created the earth at the beginning, there were no metals. God sent down metal for man to use and for some time, but at the beginning there was none. The jinn, I believe, they hate metal, and I've heard Bigfoot researchers say that they have seen things go in and go out of rocks. Of course, this is true. It's the jinn, the AKA devils. This is why Yosemite National Park has the most granite and is so huge with the mound of granite there. Obviously, is the home of a huge number of jinns. And they were not friendly. They were actually good, but like mankind, they are bad. Some believe in God, some don't. The jinn, when they enter the world through the veil of fabric, they may, they may be seen to us as an orb. They can come in the form of many things like giant birds, mothmen, sound familiar. They can also be seen as an ogre, as we can call this a Bigfoot today. Here's a quick type up of what I read in the scripture of Muhammad saw. It's pretty good. His companions were out to sea in their boat. The storm blew them onto an island. They got to the island and got to a resupply. But to their surprise, they were met by a huge hairy beast that had so much hair on it, they could not tell if it was front or back. This hairy beast is known as the spy, or as the one who was always watching. It is said to them, there is a man in the monastery who wants to meet you. There's more to the story, but I just want, to want you to hear the part about what it contains some knowledge that 1,450 years ago, the Bigfoot ogre was present. There is a jinn known to prowl on lost people in the deserts and forests. I think the name is a ghoul, but this thing is really real and is defiantly responsible for 411 cases. Now, let me explain some other spokes in the wheel. Missing shoes. This may sound crazy to people, but let's admit the 411 stuff. 411 stuff. There's a type of gin that feeds on people. Believe it or not, as crazy as this sounds, but it will suck blood via the feet of a victim. We have numerous stories about people going missing, found with no shoes, and their feet have been worn down to the bone. Obviously, nobody can walk and do this on its feet. Something else has done it, and it's a gin. Gin are poisonous, as another form they are in a snake corner, can never determine the cause of death or something. He does not know that it exists or can look into it for a type of venom, I believe, that is not known to this world. Missing time. A jinn, when it is close to someone, as Muhammad saw, taught us, your hairs on your body stand up when the jinn is close, a.k.a. goosebumps. Now, when the jinn enters someone's body, the eyes of the person will be like that of a cat. This is where we get the term rep reptilian eyes, slit eyes. And then we get real control of a person, a.k.a possess a person for that whole time they are possessed, they'll have zero memory. Okay, next spoke in the wheel I'll mention is water. Listen to this, Dave, you find it interesting. When the devil Iblis was at one point worshiping Allah in the heavens, but when he did not do as, it, as he was commanded by God, he was cast out. And when he was cast out to this earth, he made his home on water. But this is where most of the jinn live, not exactly with the devil, but in or, or in water. Their population is much greater than ours. Muhammad saw, told people 1,450 years ago, the exact location of the devil's home. Today we call that location the Bermuda Triangle. How can someone be protected from these beings causing them to be a 411 case? A person who is in full submission to God, meaning doing the daily five prayers, not being involved in bad things like smoking and drinking. They must be fasting and giving into charity and other things. They can absolutely not be harmed by any jinn. As before Isbis was sent, he was asking Allah, what can he have or what can he not have? Allah said, you cannot harm by true servants. This being someone in full submission. And Dave, this is the only way a jinn, no matter what, cannot harm them. So what I find interesting about that, I've written about world leaders in religion that disappeared under that 411 profile.
So that's that's an interesting comparison. Say the truth has come and falsehood has perished as falsehood is bound to perish in its very own, the Holy Quran. Also, this may be something else for your ears. God says in the Quran that never to hunt with the divining arrow as it is a satanic device. This made me think some jinn obviously know this and may be another reason for the hunters. Thanks, Dave. I genuinely hope you find the truth with Islam. It has answers for everything in life, everything. Sorry for my terrible grammar. It's terrible, but the information's there. No, thank you for that fascinating, fascinating letter. Folks, you guys constantly blow me away. The thinking ability out there is amazing. And I really wish we could grow this group a little faster because the more we grow it, the faster and smarter we'll be. So, got a couple pretty interesting stories for you today. Now the first one deals with a man named Bill McKinnon. And uh, Bill went missing February 14th, 1993 in Washington State. He was a student at Western Washington University. His major was French. And he and three friends went up to Church Mountain, just south of the Canadian border, about 45 minutes from Bellingham, right on the edge of the Cascades National Park. And when I do my work and something's that close, it's in. Because predators don't know that there's a line in the sand there. In the early years, Bill, ben, or correct that, Bill spent his life growing up in Buffalo, New York, and then he moved to Edmonds, Washington. Uh, his mom was a manager at Microsoft, and he attended Seattle Prep High School. And he let, after high school, he went on to three years in the Air Force. Then he went on to two different rotations with the Western Foreign Language Lab in France. Super smart guy. He was described as fun, funny, loving, and introspective. Now, this is a very rare case, folks. Bill was a black man. And people say, well, Dave, how come more black people don't disappear? Yeah, that's a very good question. But uh, two of the biggest cases involving black men that I know about are in Washington. And this is one of them. Now, they were climbing Church Mountain. That's it. It's a beautiful place, but this is in February. It was cold, snowy, wet. And Bill and his roommates had climbed before. They loved the outdoors. And Bill and the three friends went there, parked their car, got out, started hiking. They hiked for about an hour and it started to get really cold. Bill didn't think he was dressed appropriately. And in a meadow around everybody he goes, hey, I'm turning back. And they said, okay, we'll meet you back at the car. They got back to the car and Bill wasn't there. Now, this is what a site said about Church Mountain, Washington. Elevation 6,315 feet. 40, 45 minute drive from Bellingham, Church Mountain looms vertically above Highway 542. First ascent was made by W.H. Garrett, while the first winter ascent was by Heinz Ahrens and Hermann Ulrich in March 1930. The trail leading up to the previous site of a fire lookout is a classic North Cascades day hike. On a clear summer day in winter, the mountain offers a more challenging and seemingly remote wilderness experience. The bell-shaped summit offers a 360-degree view dominated by Mount Baker to the south and Mount Shuk San. Whether you're here photographing wildflowers or making fresh tracks with your snowshoes, Church Mountain is worth a visit. Given its southern exposure, the mountain melts out early, usually by mid-June, 
The mountain has also excellent winter access due to the low elevation of the trailhead. Great place. Great place. I can understand why these men and friends decided to pick it. It wasn't a real high elevation location. So, this is Church Mountain. This is Northern Cascades National Park. This is the Canadian border. Bellingham, Washington is over here. This is Mount Baker. The road goes right up to a turnout where the trailhead is. Very easy location to get to and get out of. There was no mistake because they were on a big trail about where these people were going. So, his friends get back to the car, he's not there. They search for him, call for him, honk the horn. And then they go, they call the sheriff. Whatcom County Sheriff gets called. They come out, they start searching. Well, they got the Air Force involved because Bill was a veteran. And they get the Canadians involved because it's on the border. Border Patrol gets involved because it's near the border. And then the National Park Service gets involved because it's right next to the National Park. The Canadians after, actually gave Whatcom County five days of full search efforts. They brought in professional trackers and they went to the spot where the group last saw Bill. And they found from that point going down, they couldn't find a single track. They brought in two canine teams. They couldn't pick up a scent trail. The family brought in a psychic and said that Bill was injured somewhere on the mountain and suffering. Well, after the five-day search effort by Whatcom County, they went back again a couple weeks later, didn't find anything again. Then on May 8th, 1993, there was an entirely new second push just to get the body. And they went at it for several days. They found nothing. So I sent a Freedom of Information Act request to Whatcom County. And Washington State is one of those few states that has a uh, mandatory disclosure on these things. Whatcom County told me that they dispose of all reports after five years. I have a tough time with this, friends. <laughs> so you have a man that's missing, a man that hasn't been found. Now, just what happens if his body's found and there's a bullet hole in his head? It might be real hard to re reconstruct that case when you don't have any of the reports. Just saying. So they said they didn't have the reports and they don't keep them after five years. I just went out and bought a four terabyte hard drive. And I think I paid $140 for it. It was a really nice one. Do you know how many pages of documents that drive will hold? <laughs> it's mind boggling how cheap storage is now. And the importance behind keeping a report like this is huge. So why didn't they keep it? Well, there's a lot of things about this case that bother me. First of all, is it believable that Bill walked away from this group because he recognized he wasn't dressed for the cold? Absolutely, three people said it. Three people were interviewed. They all verified each other's story. 100% agree. So what could happen to Bill? Well, he was about an hour away from the car hiking. It's downhill. And he's hiked many times before with this, with his roommate and this group. He had no disabilities. Very smart young man. So could there have been predation between where he last saw the group and the car? Uh, no. Nobody heard any screams. Nobody found any blood. 
the search which happened and started the next day went over that route and searched within everything of, I think they said for five miles. They didn't find any sign of predation. At the time when they were searching for Bill, there was some talk amongst the searchers that, well, he finally got to the bottom of the hill and he found somebody driving away and they just drove him home. Oh, one big problem with that? He never made it home. So, and nobody thought that Bill would get in a car with somebody else. So, don't think that happened. But it's a very mysterious disappearance. And I read some stories about his mom being devastated. She lost her son, and I, I can 100% understand that. Uh, he was a student at the time that he disappeared. And he was trying to get a degree, and he was right on the edge of getting a degree in French. And in fact, his mom went to the graduation ceremonies and they announced his name was graduating that year. Every once in a while doing these cases, it, it hits my soul. It bothers me a lot. This isn't some big technical crime where he disappeared in the middle of a rocky nowhere. We're last seen in a meadow. Yeah. Mrs. McKinnon, feel that pain. And Bill McKinnon was never found. The next case. Next case involves one of the strangest I've ever been involved in, meaning apps, uh, meaning I got to actually read the reports. In Yosemite, Jean Hesselschwert, 37 years old, missing July 9th, 1995, in the area of Glacier Point, Yosemite. Now, Jean was a clinical social worker about helping people from Lowell, Massachusetts. And she worked at the mental health unit in, at Lowell Health. She was born in Roslindale, Mass, and graduated from the Girls Latin School and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And she had a master's degree in social work from Rhode Island College. In the past, she'd been a guidance counselor at Catholic Charities and her family said she was a social conscious of the family. She had two brothers. She had no children. And when I filed the Freedom of Information Act request against the National Park Service for documents, the Park Service said that they were withholding several and they never made it clear why. Now in June 1995, Jean and her longtime live-in boyfriend, Mike Monahan, decided to take a vacation. They'd been in a 10-year relationship, and they'd recently been engaged. They planned a trip sightseeing through the western U.S., and they wanted to do some camping in the Sierras. They first stopped in Lake Tahoe, and they were on a Sierra Club-sponsored backpacking trip. And according to everything that we could learn, the week-long trip went really well. And afterwards, they headed for Yosemite. Well, on July 9th, 1995, Mike and Jean drove into Yosemite National Park at 10, 12 a.m. They drove up and took a paved turnout at a place called Summit Meadow, a place that's only open in the summer, and they parked their car, they got out, and this, they decided to take different hikes and agreed to meet back 15 minutes later. Well, Gene didn't return. Now, where is this? So, this is the bottom of the valley. And this is the Yosemite Valley area view. And this is Bridal Veil Falls Trailhead. This is Badger Pass, a ski area. 
Summit Meadows right here, not very far at all from Badger Pass. And then this is Bridal Veil Creek. And her body was found down in this area about three miles away. Super rough terrain. Now I'm going to get to the nitty gritty on this, That why we're talking about it. First of all, Mike searched for 15 minutes, yelling, screaming. Couldn't find any. Couldn't find her. Then he finds a National Park Service employee that was picking up um, trash cans. He explains he needs help. He calls for the rangers. Within several minutes, they're on scene. And with, within an hour, the National Park Service rangers on scene called and stated they needed reinforcements. And what responded was overwhelming. Eight different dog teams were utilized along with a hundred ground searchers. Park officials were asked the second and the third day by reporters from the East Coast if their bears or mountain lions might not have attacked Gene. In a very funny response, the Park Service said that their bears don't attack people. So what he said, their bears don't attack people. Friends, bears are dangerous. I don't care what the Park Service man says. Bears are dangerous. Wild bears are really dangerous. You be careful around them. Don't feed them. Don't get near them. Stay away from them. Helicopters flew every day for 10 days searching the area, and they didn't see Gene. Now, I want you to think about this. Within days, the helicopters were on scene. Gene's at a location, and it's a really rugged, granite-infested, big boulder area. And while the helicopters are constantly flying over, anybody would know to stand up on top of a boulder and wave your arm and the helicopter would see you. In fact, a search and rescue helicopter pilot told me one time a, a great thing to do if you're ever lost. And he said, Dave, you take, you take a brightest piece, piece of clothing you have and then you wave it over your head in a circular motion and that will attract attention and I will see that. That's what the pilot said. Great idea. So, they didn't say anything. Canyon's never picked up a cent. The reports stated that searchers found two boot impressions that they attributed to Gene. One was near the car, and one was crossing a large trail. They thought it was hers, but they discounted it because it didn't make sense. She was lost, she'd stay on the trail. Nobody believed she'd leave a trail. That wasn't the kind of trekker she was. They asked Mike, well, what do you think she'd do? And he said that she would go to boulders, find a really large boulder, lay down and sun herself. He said the total time they were separated was maybe 10 minutes before he started looking for her. So the canine teams that were there one of the canine handlers stated the dog didn't pick up anything and he outwardly questioned whether Gene was ever at that site. That's pretty strong, folks. <laughs> when you start saying stuff like that, you better have a really good dog. So that was stated and it was at about this time the family requested the FBI get involved to investigate. FBI does not search for missing adults. The FBI only gets involved if they believe there's some type of criminal misconduct. So they asked Mike to take a polygraph. He says, sure. Mike takes the polygraph and according to all the reports, passed it perfectly. Meaning he has no idea where Jean is at. He has no idea what happened to her. And the statements he made, because they'd cover each one, were truthful without deception. So take Mike off your list of suspects. 
So the FBI did interview. And I did file a Freedom of Information Act request against the FBI for a folder on Gene's case. And guess what they said? They said, because of privacy concerns with the victim, we cannot release these reports. I've had that 10 times from the FBI. They know she's not alive. Dead people don't have privacy rights. But the FBI doesn't care. I write appeal. I said, victim is deceased. I please reconsider. I want the report. I get it back six weeks later. No, nope, denied. They don't care. The only way you can force the FBI to comply is to take them to federal court. And of course they should be giving up these reports, but they, they don't think about us in that way. It's their property. It's not our property. Even though the law says we have a right to those reports. It doesn't matter. They're violating the law. So this happened July 9th, 1995. So about two months later, September 3rd, 1995. Well, first of all, the search for Gene goes on for two weeks, nothing. The FBI goes on for four to six weeks. They finally throw up their hands and say, hey, we don't have anything. There's no crime we could see that occurred. We don't know where she is, but we give up. September 3rd, 1995, Yosemite resident Mike Ulowski was fishing with a friend about three quarters of a mile above Bridal Veil Falls and three miles from the location where Gene was last seen. And in a body of water, a small pool of water, they're fishing. They think they see a body in amongst some boulders. So they call the National Park Service. Park Service eventually gets there and they can't bring a helicopter in because it's too windy. But they do identify it as a human. They say it's massively deteriorated, but they get the body and they send it to coroner for ID. Mike was asked publicly about the location of the body. This is what he says. He says the area is really inaccessible to anyone other than rock and mountain climbers. It's very rugged. Think about that. It's inaccessible to anyone other than rock and mountain climbers. It's very rugged. Sound like, sound like somewhere a 37 year old social worker would go? I don't think so. She was ID'd by dental records and she was entirely naked except for one boot. NPS made an interesting statement in one of the records. It said that the body could not have gotten to that location by water. It had too many blockages in the creek system. So she disappears at an elevation of 7,000 feet and she's found in an elevation of 5,300 feet, about three miles away. If water didn't transport the body to that location, how did Jean Hesselschwert get there? Keep in mind what her boyfriend Mike said, inaccessible. Let's review the facts. Eight dog teams worked the case, never could find a scent. Her boyfriend passes a polygraph. He's not involved. Get it out of your head. No tracks, no scent trail. FBI says no crime. Rock climbers, some people I know are thinking this, well, a rock climber on that was bouldering must have abducted her and taken her up there and dumped her body. No. If anybody's rock climbed, you could barely get yourself up the mountain, let alone somebody else who doesn't want to go. How did Jean get to that spot? It's, 
It's a big who done it to me. But it fits everything I talk about in 411 cases. Point of separation. Her and Mike were together and they decide to go to different locations to hike. Lack of tracks. Lack of scent trail. Goes missing in and around Granite in the biggest cluster of missing people in the world. She's found in water, naked. Yeah. It has me wondering. In the reports I read, there was no determination on the cause of death, and I, I, it, they didn't. They didn't state why there was no determination, whether it was because she was so deteriorated, or because they couldn't. I don't, it, it was not understandable. But I will tell you, folks, that on its face. This case was strange from the beginning. Now, I've told you before, I've known the FBI get into these cases, they write up all the facts, and they never talk about it again. And all these reports are stated, I guarantee they're in a case file. I guarantee they're in a case file at a profiler's unit in Quantico. Because they did the same thing to this I'm doing right now. I know it. And there are, they are as puzzled to what's going on as I am. And you are. Jean's family lost a really great young woman. Mike lost a, his fiance. Some of the articles early on didn't paint Mike in the best picture. And that, that irritated the heck out of me. Because I knew what was going to happen with this when I was reading it, and, you know, 15 years after it happened. When I read it, I kind of knew that this is, this is not going to turn out well. And it wasn't going to be Mike's fault. And I'm sure he blamed himself for it a lot. And until he took that polygraph and cleared himself, I'm sure people didn't believe he didn't have a hand in it. But Mike... If you're watching, I'm an advocate for you. I, I know you didn't do any, anything to Gene. So folks, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Please watch the movie trailer. Do me a big favor and pass that movie trailer all around to all your social media sites. I hope I'll see a lot of you in Arizona in November at the premiere. And, uh, one last thing, be a good member of your community. Do good things for people out there. Treat people with respect and dignity. It doesn't cost you anything. And maybe you'll make somebody really happy today by doing them a small favor. Politis out.